Okay. So, Marsha, we're being recorded now. Did you hear that? And I have, yes, I have a number to give you for the playback. Okay. So, let's start on page, um, so we're reading the Facing Codependence book, and uh, we're going to go to Passive Content, and we're going to go to the forward. Would you like okay. to start? It? And then you'll read a paragraph, I'll read a paragraph, and you'll read, okay. after we're finished reading the forward, we'll go into the video, okay? Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean the audio. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Okay. All right. You want me to read the first paragraph? Please. Uh-huh. Okay. Forward. In certain men and women, normal human feelings, such as shame, fear, pain, and anger, are so magnified that these people are almost always in an emotional state marked by anxiety and feelings of being irrational, dysfunctional, and or crazy. Such people also think they should be able to make, make those around them happy. And when they can't, they feel as if they are somehow less than others. Okay. These people often find themselves, well, after we read it, let's kind of discuss it and then look at the video. Uh, okay. these, people, <clears throat> these people often find themselves overreacting to everyday happening, experiencing feelings far more excessive than appropriate for a given situation. For example, when something frightening happens, instead of normal fear, they experience panic um, or anxiety attacks. These mm-hmm. attacks can also occur for no reason. When some of life's normal pain comes their way, their experience may be deep despair, hopelessness, or perhaps suicidal thoughts or behavior. And when a situation arises that would ordinarily provoke some genuine appropriate anger, Such people sometimes explode into volcanic rage. And during these extreme emotional experiences, they often think, why does he treat me this way? Doesn't he know how painful it is to me? But they cannot control the emotional outbursts and are baffled. Mm -hmm. These intense emotional reactions often occur over life's less dramatic experiences such as a disagreement with one's spouse over which movie to see or where to go on vacation. Despair or rage can be triggered by the disappointment of interviewing for a job and not being hired, the sadness of a good friend's moving to another town, or the anger of the neighbor's dog messing up the flower bed. Any of these experiences can evoke emotional reactions that are far from moderate. They can range from intense explosive feelings to bland sweetness and lack of any emotional (coughs) expression at all. But both of the, (coughs) sorry, both of these seemingly uncontrollable reactions sabotage the lives and relationships of such people. Anything uh, is uh, ranging, uh, ranging for, I mean, to be true for you yet? Um, uh, well, I I think some of the intense reactions that I yeah, have are me too, me inappropriate. Too. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, definitely, me too. Yeah, mm-hmm. there is now much documented evidence pointing to the fact that the physical stress of living with pent up or explosive feelings may contribute to physical disorders such as high blood pressure, heart disease, arthritis, migraine headaches, cancer, and others. This emotional factor of codependence can sabotage our health as well as our relationships. Mm -hmm. Oh, I believe that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And yet these men and women operate as if they believe that only by being perfect in all they do or by pleasing the people around them can they claim the outsized, uncontrollable, and irrational feelings that tyrannize them. They live in the delusion that the bad feelings that they sometimes find almost overwhelming, can be quelled if they can just do it better or win the approval of certain important people in their lives. By this attitude, they unconsciously make those people important and their approval responsible for their own happiness. When those they try to please don't appreciate what I'm doing for them and will not give the crucial approval, the emotionally tyrannized individuals become furious. But since the good opinion of the would-be approved approval giver is so important, 
This rage must be repressed. And although this rage isn't shown directly, the anger may come out sideways in sarcasm, forgetfulness, hostile jokes, or other passive-aggressive behaviors. Often, such men and women appear to be gentle and helpful. A closer examination, however, reveals in them a powerful need to control and manipulate those around them into giving them the approval they believe they need to subdue their overwhelming feelings. But all their efforts are of no use in the long run because no one can take away the overwhelming part of their feelings. They may come to believe there is no hope for them. On the other hand, in some people with quite similar backgrounds, a very different thing happens. The normal human emotions are so minimized that they hardly experience any feelings at all. No fear, no pain, no anger, no shame, and also no joy, no pleasure, no contentment. They shuffle numbly through life from one day to the next. It was actually the families of alcoholics and other chemically dependent people who brought these two clusters of symptoms to the attention of therapists and treatment centers. These family members all seem to be plagued with intensified feelings of shame, fear, anger, and pain in their relationships with the alcoholic or addict who was the focal point of their family but they often were not able to express these feelings in a healthy way because of a compulsion to please and care for the addicted person. Mm -hmm. Their efforts were ostensibly to get the chemical dependent, sober, or free from drugs. However, there were also some common irrational aspects to this relationship between the family and the alcoholic. One irrational aspect was that most of the family members had a deluded hope that if they could only be perfect in their relating to and helping the alcoholic, he or she would become sober, and they, the family members, would be free of their awful shame, pain, fear, and anger. I still believe this. I still mm -hmm. believe this. But this mm -hmm. strategy never worked. Even mm -hmm. when the alcoholic got sober, the family often stayed sick. Mm -hmm. and actually appeared to resent the sobriety. Sometimes they sabotaged it. It was as if the family needed the addict to stay sick and dependent on them so they could maintain their dependence on him or her, her in hopes of explaining their exaggerated bad feelings. Mm -hmm. Yep. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in some ways... The alcoholic directly or indirectly abused the family members by his or her self-centered behavior. Sometimes the addicted family member would be so physically, sexually, or emotionally abusive that any normal person would have left the relationship. And that's the second irrational aspect in these family members' relationship to the addicted person. They did not leave and seemed to be locked in a joint sickness with the addict. Mm-hmm. That's my grandmother. The family members continuing to stay in a relationship despite harmful consequences or harmful consequence abuse parallel to the alcoholics continuing to drink despite harmful consequences. Thus, it became clear that as the alcoholic depended on alcohol to handle the overwhelming feelings of his or her disease, the family depended on the alcoholic. Mm -hmm in a sick and similarly addictive way. In other words, the alcoholic and codependent were trying to solve identical basic symptoms of the same disease, the addict with alcohol or drugs and the codependent with the addictive relationship. Wow. Yeah. I know. Isn't that good? Wow, oh, that's pretty, pretty, it's pretty scary. Oh. This, dependence, <laughs> this dependence with an addict led therapists to the awareness that a painful and crippling disease was in operation, a disease they later realized was also operating in countless families across America that had no chemically dependent member. 
We believe that these people are in the grip of a serious underlying disease called codependence or codependency. And only a few of the sufferers know anything about a cure for the crippling symptoms described earlier. Yet people who have codependence often wind up in despair and actually die from its effects. The death certificates never mention the disease by name. Instead, the victim's histories tell of hopelessness, suicides, quote, accidents, unquote, cardiovascular problems, and malignant diseases related to self-neglect, stress, and repressed anger and its accompanying depression. Gee, mm. man. <laughs> the disease is amazingly difficult to see from the outside because its sufferers wear a mask of adequacy and success designed to win the all-important approval. But these slaves of powerful, seemingly groundless, compulsive feelings are doomed to be on an endless treadmill of personal failure and intensified experiences of shame, pain, fear, and repressed anger. In fact, many people in their efforts to flee these overwhelming feelings turn to chemicals to numb their discomfort. They are set up to be alcoholics or other kinds of addicts. We believe that codependence underlies and fuels these addictions. When an alcoholic or any other addict gets rid of the addictive chemical agent or behavior, then that person will often have to face the consequences and the symptoms of codependence on the road to recovery. During the past eight years, <clears throat> Pia Melody has developed a therapy for codependence at the Meadows, a treatment center for addictions in Wickenburg, Arizona. She has personally led hundreds of people suffering from the agonies of codependence into recovery and wholeness. The purpose of this book is not to give a detailed history of the development of the concept of codependence or arguments concerning its status as a bona fide disease. Its purpose is to describe the disease as Pia Melody has seen it from the inside in hundreds of patients' lives, including her own, although all of the authors have contributed to this book. The first person singular has been used by Pia Melody to describe the disease and the approach to recovery presented here. The therapeutic concepts, methods, and eclectic approach are in the language that has come out of the cauldron of Pia Melody's experience of fighting the disease and not from a theoretical base. In fact, this is not an attempt to devise or defend a theoretical construct at all. Rather, the authors intend to describe the structure of the disease of codependence in terms of the way it operates in everyday life and relationships, and two, to point to a practical model that works in healing people who suffer from the symptoms. For those uh, interested in the history and the development of the notion of codependence in the psychological literature, we have provided a brief appendix in the back of this book. Yeah. Okay, okay, I got it. Uh, <laughs> now, many of the concepts of this book, such as the connection of codependence to child abuse and the description of external and internal boundaries, <clears throat> um, were formulated and first used by Pia Melody years ago. The fact that some of these ideas have become known and used among therapists and codependents everywhere uh, through her lectures and tape series, Permission to be Precious, is a tribute to Pia's insights. And we are pleased to be working on this project to present her views of codependence and ours in an organized, written form. We hope that from reading these pages, those who are plagued by this disease will be able to face it and get into recovery. And because the very acts of facing codependence and moving beyond denial have brought us to the beginning of hope and recovery in our own lives. A codependency, a permission to be precious update. The title of this tape is Codependency as a Disease. Thanks. I feel sorry for my friends. I always like to do things like that. I figure if I could be out in public exposing myself 
do scrutiny like that, they need to have the same experience, too. Let me explain what's going to happen today, because we are recording this. And um, if you have some idea. This is probably the way to go, huh? Yeah, this is better. OK, so let's, let's listen to this for 10 minutes. It's the same thing, huh? Yeah, well, this is actually more in detail. This one is. OK. Yeah. Okay. OK. It's just that, OK, she skirts around a lot. She doesn't get down to it in 10 minutes. Do you want to listen to it for more than? Well, how about I come, I'll, I'll ask you in 10 minutes if you want to hear more, and then we'll OK. Play. OK. OK. I'm going to be recording six tapes. Um, it's kind of like Permission to be Precious, part two. When I did Permission to be Precious, I originally did that in about 1980. It was 85. Um, I had to do it again because the way I recorded it caused people to go into spontaneous regressions when they were listening to it. And a lot of people were trying to drive their cars and listen to those things on the radio. And there was one point in it where I yelled to show you what it was like to be verbally abused through the volume. And that freaked everybody out. So what I finally did was do it again in about 1986. But since 1986, I found out a lot. I have a different way of talking about some of it. And Walt's been asking me to go through it again and kind of record new ideas. And I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to do it because I can no longer talk the way I talked in 1986. I don't have the same intensity around this stuff as I did then. Actually, I don't have the anger I had back then. And, 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 I, and some of the fervor. I have, I have a different thing. It's like life, life's a lot funnier now to me. And the paradoxes and the craziness involved. All the, all the double binds that used to drive me crazy now just seem hilarious. So it's like I could never do Permission to be Precious as I did it in 1986 or 1985 and, and way before that. So I had to do that and I thought, well, um, when something keeps gnawing at me or somebody keeps asking me to do something again and again and again and again, after a while, I usually think that's like, my higher power knocking on my head saying, this is something you need to do, Pia. You know, and I know it'll just persist like that. So I finally agreed to come to LA and do it. Now let's mm -hmm. see how it's going to happen. From 9 to 9, well, from now, for 45 minutes, and since I entered this thing, I'm going to do the first tape, which is looking at codependence as a disease process. Then we'll take a break. I'm going to take a break after every tape, just because you're sitting on those chairs and and that's hard to sit like that and to get up and move around for a minute. We can even do stretching exercises together. And besides that, it's moderate for me, so I don't go hours like I can do and then wind up in a heat tomorrow morning when Pat wants to go flying in the airplane and I'm so exhausted I can't get out of bed. So we'll do that for 45 minutes, take a break. Then, we'll, then I'll discuss with you the etiology of codependence or the cause for 45 minutes, then we'll break. And then I'll talk about the function of shame in regards to the disease. And then we'll take a break for lunch, which will be an hour and 15 minutes. Now, if we're lucky and, and I can do this the way I want to do it, we'll be breaking for lunch um, sometime around uh, between 11.45 and 12. Maybe it might go over, but we'll take about an hour and 15 minutes for lunch. And coming back then, I'll do a 45-minute lecture on boundaries, kind of talking about it the way I talk about it now. Even though the basic structure of it isn't that different, there's some ways I talk about it that is different. I'm trying to make it easier to understand. And then we'll take a break. And then I'll talk about recovery part one, recovery part two. And that's just a bunch of ideas I have about recovery and some of my own biases and stuff like that. Um, and then I'm hoping to wind up about 4 o'clock for half an hour questions and answers. And you're free to leave at 4 if you want, or stay and just hassle through a bunch of junk you want to ask me. And I'll do the best I can with that. Okay, so that's what our day will look like. All right, and it's rugged. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. I have a tendency. I have a, I have a thing about going and listening to people talk. And I can't stand it when I finish a day and I have about four sentences down on a piece of paper. I like to have 20 sheets of paper with information I can take home and gnaw on for a long time. <laughs> be challenged and I like, to, I like to disagree and then figure out why I'm disagreeing. I don't like to get up and challenge them. I mean in my own head. And because I have that own bias, what I do is I go on overboard, of course, because I'm codependent and I operate in extremes, and I load people up too much. I just throw too much at you. I can't help it. 
I, I really can't help that. I try to not do that. But when I do, I get bored. And I think I sound boring. So if you feel like you're getting mashed back into your seat, it's like, oh my God, if she says one more time, I'm going to, one more thing, I'm going to freak out. That's normal when you listen to me. Okay? <laughs> I have experience of listening to one of my tapes. I've never listened to any of my tapes except one time. When I had to repeat the lecture and I couldn't remember what I said, it took me days to listen to the tape. I couldn't follow myself. I had to listen. I had to stop it and start it and stop it and start it. I never understood why people kind of after a while were looking like they were dazed. Now I understand why, but I can't help it, so you just have to bear with me. Um, okay, so let's start on codependence as a disease. And let me quote from you something from Dorland's Medical Dictionary on what disease is. I, I wrote this down as a result of having to do, I agreed to do something I wished I'd never agreed to do. That seems to be the story in my life. I agreed to go to Dallas and debate two psychiatrists on whether codependence was a disease or not. Mm -hmm. I really regret the experience because mm -hmm. to a person personalities about principles in about a half an hour, and I was the one that was doing that. We were supposed to be arguing whether codependence is a disease, and what they were arguing, things that they were arguing about was that this whole process makes people feel sick, and you shouldn't do that to people. It makes offenders feel terrible about themselves, and you shouldn't do that to people. It screws up Al-Anon and some things like that. And, and I was saying to myself, we're not talking about this as a disease. We're talking about whether whether the, uh, whether the concept is going to help people or not. And that's not what the discussion was. And, blah, 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 blah. and I got all wrapped up in that sort of thing. So, and then I discovered they weren't. They hadn't read my book. They had read Melody Beatty's book. And I don't agree. I mean, I think the books are wonderful, and I encourage you to read them. But it's not quite how I think about the disease. So we weren't even arguing about the same subject. So I launched into my principle, uh, personality about principles when I got my chance to rebut, and I just said, it's obvious you haven't read my book, which, of course, freaked them out. <laughs> and I caught them. But you shouldn't do that, you know. But I do like to get even. <laughs> and so it went, on, it went from there down. Um, so, Marcia, how is it so far? Can you hear it good? It's good, yeah. I can hear it perfectly. Okay, here I go. And one of the psychiatrists lost her cool completely and wound up saying, wait, I'll rewind it a little bit. If you think it's too long, I mean, if we, we can do the other one because I could hear it mostly, but. No, no, let's go, let's go for it. With it. Okay. <laughs> and so it went, on, it went from there down. Um, and one of the psychiatrists lost her cool completely and wound up saying the F word, so then I really won, you know, so anyway, that, <laughs> that's how sick I am. I love to get even. But anyway, um, let's, let me talk about it as a disease process. First of all, I was raised in the medical model as an RN. So I never could understand why people were talking about the disease the way they were. Cause they, I think it because they were therapists and coming at it from like uh, a behavioral perspective and like what I would call characteristics, and, and it didn't make sense to me. It's like you weren't talking about the disease. You're talking about things that were like it, but not down to the heart and soul of it. When you talk about a disease, what you have to do is describe what they call a characteristic train of symptoms. You have to talk about how the disease as it's, at its basic level operates because that's what you treat. They're called the primary symptoms. And the primary symptoms reflect the core of the experience of the illness. And again, why you go, why a physician would always examine that issue or why when people are trying to notice that there's a new illness or something they need to describe, they try to take it down to its very basic level because that's what you treat. So you have to know what to treat, so that's why you describe the illness like that. In Dorland's Medical Dictionary, they define a disease as a definite morbid process having a characteristic train of symptoms which may affect the whole body or any of its parts. A symptom is defined as any functional evidence of a disease or a patient's condition 
or a change in a patient's condition that is indicative that some pathological, which, which means uh, unhealthy, process is going on within the body or the mind. This thing is a disease. There's no doubt about it. It is a disease. And the five, so I believe there are five primary symptoms of the illness. Do you guys have an overview in your lap? You know, that big okay, sheet that I used minutes. to work you off. We'll get that thing. You want to go ahead and do another 10? Um, what else are we going to do in this, this uh, conference call? Uh, we were going to look in the workbook. Workbook. Um, I, uh, I, let's see, how much, how long will the workbook part take, do you think? Um, well, it, I think that this part is probably before the workbook part. Okay. I'll yeah. go another 10. Okay, yeah. All right. So that you can follow me. Now, look at that second column over from the left, and that, and you see the heading on that says primary symptoms. See that? See that column, the top of that column? On the, it, reading it horizontally, don't turn, turn it to the back. See where it says primary symptoms of this illness? So that, those five things are what I call the core of codependence, or the core of the illness, or the primary symptoms. These things describe the illness. And, it's, and, and I believe you, you, it is really important not to say you're in your disease unless you're doing one of these things, OK? Because that makes you focus on the very, very nature of the illness when you're trying to describe it. Now, what's on that paper is that, code of, it, let me give you a definition. Codependence is a disorder or a disease of immaturity caused by childhood trauma. So there, there's what it is, and that's the ideology. The cause is childhood trauma. But it is about failed development. This is not about, it's, it's failed development to the point you're morbid. That's what it's about. That's why I hate to label it as a disease, because how can you call failed development a disease? Well, the reason why you can call failed development a disease is because when you have not learned to do these things for the self, you are going to be sick. It's inevitable that you're going to feel awful. But more importantly, what the main thing is about this disease is that if you have these symptoms, you will never live your life. You will never what was it? One of these symptoms is about personality function. Like your ability to do these things for the self enables you to really, truly live your life. If you cannot do these things for the self, you're never going to live. You're going to sit perched, waiting to start your life. Any of you do that? It's like, well, as soon as I get thin enough, things are going to finally work out, and I can really do all these things I'm thinking about. You know, or as soon as I finally love myself, I'll begin my life. Or as soon as I, you know, whatever it is, I'll, I'll, as soon as I find a mate, a partner, I can begin my life. As soon as I have a kid, I can begin my life. You know, it's like you never get started and life is going on and it passes you by and you wonder what happened. And you don't feel good about yourself. Uh, what I say is you cannot live your life. You can't be out there in action for the self if you cannot do these things for the self. And, and these, these things that I described as the core symptom reflect how one's personality has not formed. And each one is about how you relate to you. That's why it is so difficult, and it has been so difficult for people to describe this illness and why they fight over what it is, because these things are so much a part of how a person functions that they're very hard to describe unless you know exactly what they are, if you figured it out. Now, the first one, so I define codependence as a disease of immaturity caused by childhood trauma that is about five core symptoms. And that when you're experiencing one of these symptoms, you're experiencing your codependence or you're having an immaturity attack. When I'm actually uh, uh, sponsoring a codependent or talking to one of my codependent friends or describing myself, or treating somebody therapeutically, I do not let them use the term codependent when they're describing their illness. They cannot say to me, I'm having an attack of codependence, or I'm being codependent, or I'm coing somebody. I actually want to slap them silly, actually, when they say that. I say, don't say that to me. If you're going to work with me, I'm going to control you. And what the control is about is that you can only describe the disease by saying you're acting immaturely. I'm in an attack of immaturity. I am being immature. 
one of those is what I limit it to because because if I don't do that, I am not if I'm sponsoring or doing something therapeutic or being their friend and they're asking for help, I cannot help them unless I do that because the disease is so slippery. It's such a function of personality. Of, of the developing ego that if you don't do that, the person won't get it very easy and I'll stay confused. Okay, now the first symptom is that the codependent has difficulty experiencing appropriate levels of self-esteem. And that's all written out on the back. You don't even have to write that down. It's on the back of that sheet. What that means is that is the codependent ha is having trouble with self-love. Love is the word I want you to really focus on there. That's what esteem is. The esteem, as I said before, is the ability to experience one's own preciousness. When you esteem yourself or, or value yourself, what's going on is you're in a moment of knowing you have inherent worth. And that is about loving the self. And the experience of self-esteem is the experience of one's own self-love. In the disease, we either underdo it or overdo it. We either see ourselves as worth less than others or we see ourselves as better than. And, and what I want to point out is that this symptom is done in the extremes. You either overdo it and get arrogant, grandiose, and look down on others, or you underdo it. You get down on your knees and grovel around and nod somebody's hammer cuff and believe that they are so much more valuable than you are because, after all, it's not equal. They're prettier. They have more money. They have a better-looking meat. You know, they're, they're wearing Gucci shoes. But they got a big diamond on there. They know they have more value than I do. They're more educated. They have fewer pimples. So whatever it is, they're gourmet cooks. You know, and you can't boil water. That means they have more inherent worth than you do. Or you're on the other end, getting an inventory on how worthless they are than you, because you have all these things they don't have, and therefore you're better. I mean, you're more talented. You're brighter. You're prettier. You have a more attractive mate. You know, your kids are more successful. I mean, after all, her kids are in jail, and my kids are at Harvard. So therefore, I'm fine, and I'm better, and I'm more successful, and I did it right. <laughs> like you had something to do with somebody going to Harvard. Like that mm -hmm. was their choice and their talent. It's nuts. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's and arrogant and grandiose and one up and a higher power to another person. So your own whacked out internal process is as sick as being down on your knees groveling around. The problem is it just feels better. That's yeah. the problem because you don't want to stop it because it makes you feel better than. And actually people in that position do better in this culture. And I'll tell you, when I get into talking about shame, I'll explain why, why I think that is. So we have trouble self-loving. We, we either underdo it or overdo it. That's the first core symptom. Okay, I think that's a good place to stop. Huh? Okay. I think, yeah, yeah, because... Yeah, she's uh, good. Yeah, isn't she good? Uh, so mm -hmm. let me get off a of speaker and... Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So let's go to the workbook and let's go to step one uh -huh. uh, of page 28. And okay. just, since we went through course symptom number one, maybe that's what we should work on. What page did you say, 28? Uh-huh, I did. Okay. Eight... Seven, twenty-eight. Step one. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. So that's the page we're going to start on. But first, I wanted to get whatever your feedback was because that was some incredible stuff to hear. I just wanted mm -hmm. to hear, you know, what your experience uh -huh. was like listening to that. Yeah. Um, well, I definitely can see how it involves self-esteem. I mean, I think that's pretty core issue. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Too much or too little self-esteem. Uh, hmm, yeah. Oh. I don't think I'd suffer from too much self-esteem. I think I'd <laughs> suffer from too little. Um, but have, having trouble self-loving. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, yeah. pretty core, I think. Um, yeah. That's what I see. Primary symptoms, immaturity, cause of childhood trauma. Yeah, I I just took a few notes and, and yeah, because you can go back whenever you want to listen to it again. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. No, I I think uh, I think it's I don't have anything anything more to say. What do you think? What do you? No, well, I just loved hearing you say that because you know I I hear it a lot and I listen to it a lot by myself. So I don't I just keep getting the same thing out of it. So uh -huh. to hear yeah 
to hear uh, a different perspective, which is when you, when you said, yeah, self-esteem is a pretty core issue, that just really resonated very deeply for me as being true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sure does. Impression that you were quite eager to get into doing some work. Is, was that yeah, correct? I am. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's go. Let's stay with step one then. Okay. Mm-hmm. okay. I love how in this book they call it powerless over ourselves because I never got CODA's first step, powerless over others. I feel like I don't get that, and it's going to take a long time. You're right. Know. You're right. Yeah. It is ourselves that is more, more crucial. Right. So mm-hmm. this helps me. This gives me a comprehensive understanding. Okay. So we admitted we were powerless over ourselves and that our lives had become unmanageable. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. So um, you read a paragraph. I read one. You read one. I Okay. Go ahead. Okay. It says, I have divided step one into two sets of exercises around the two key words, powerless and unmanageable. I believe it is necessary to write about both how about both how you are powerless and how your life is unmanageable to fully make the admissions required by this step. Um, you will, powerless and unmanageable. I don't see any difference. Those are kind of kind of the same. But anyway, <laughs> okay. You want to read the next paragraph? Sure. You will explore the specific way you experience powerlessness over your codependence by writing about each core symptom. You will explore the unmanageability you experience as a result of your codependence by writing about what happens as a result of these symptoms. Mm-hmm. So it's going to talk about core symptoms over here. Okay, good. Mm-hmm. Yep. The writing you do for step one will provide a base of information that you will be using throughout the rest of the steps. The more thorough you can be at this stage, the more benefit you will get from the later steps. And that's true. She'll refer back to back, back to this, back to this, back to this. It's almost annoying. Powerless <laughs> over, powerlessness over codependence. Purpose mm-hmm. of exercise. These exercises are designed to help you see more clearly how the five core symptoms of codependence are operating in your life. By getting very specific in your descriptions, you can begin to move beyond denial out of the general awareness that, yes, I'm a codependent, into knowing precisely which thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are codependent and how they are affecting your life. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's getting the nail in the nail on the head. Yeah. Uh Uh, the, the the wording of this step from Codependence Anonymous is we admitted we were oh okay others that's just a footnote you know go ahead read that read the footnote okay. that was powerful we admitted we were powerless over others and that our lives had become unmanageable in my opinion however we ourselves affect our relationships with others so I use the word ourselves in this step for the purpose of this workbook okay okay. And then she says, in addition to doing the background reading assigned in this workbook, going to 12-step meetings such as Codependence Anonymous, uh, the background reading will be in in the, in her other book, right? Right. Yeah, okay, in the facing, facing Codependence. Right. Okay, uh-huh. all right, assigned in this workbook. Going to 12-step meetings and such as Codependence Anonymous is a very helpful way to come out of denial and delusion and stop minimizing Listening to people describe their dependence, their experiences with these symptoms can often trigger a realization of your own experience with a symptom. If you have an opportunity to chair a meeting, suggest that the topic of discussion be the symptom you are writing about. Share what you have learned about yourself so far. Then listen to the discussion. Even if you are not chairing, you can share your own discoveries. Often, uh, which often prompts others to share theirs about the same problem. Of course, meetings are beneficial for both working uh, through the rest of the steps and after you've been completely through the steps in the first time. But they can be especially helpful during your writing of step one. Oh, okay. In facing codependence, I have identified five core or primary symptoms of codependence 
that arise when a child in a dysfunctional family is not helped to develop or mature. These core symptoms seem to describe what child abuse actually does to a person. I look at each one as an issue of powerlessness because when you are experiencing any specific symptom, you can't stop it from happening. You are, you are operating from an automatic, deeply grooved pattern and thus rendered powerless to act like a mature adult. For example, feeling great shame when you make a simple mistake in front of someone. Also, the symptoms take over without your knowing they are happening to you. That is so true for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Symptoms take over without your knowing they are happening to you. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I guess that's true because I don't even yeah. know quite understand that yet, but anyway, I will. Um, Yeah, you will. In my opinion, the first core symptom difficulty, uh, first core symptom, difficulty experiencing appropriate levels of self-esteem is the most crucial. The second most important is difficulty setting functional boundaries. I have found that these two core symptoms must be treated before the other three symptoms can be adequately addressed. So I strongly suggest taking these symptoms in the order presented in this workbook. Complete the suggested background reading before you write about each symptom. Read about one symptom at a time. Then do the writing about the symptom before reading about the next symptom. Mm -hmm. As a reminder, this exercise is not meant to be completed in an evening or even a week of daily writing. Don't worry if you need to spend a month or longer on it. As your denial, minimization, um, and delusion gradually recede, you will be able to write a little more. Okay. Okay. Core symptom one. Difficulty experiencing appropriate levels of self-esteem. Background reading. Pages 7 to 10 in Chapter 2 of Facing Codependence. Mm Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, let's do the background reading. Okay. Page 7 in Facing Codependence. Mm-hmm. Okay. Page 7. Unless you okay. have a different... Yeah, the five core symptoms of codependence. Okay. All right, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Core symptom one, difficulty experiencing appropriate appropriate levels of self-esteem. Healthy self-esteem is the internal experience of one's own preciousness and value as a person. It comes comes from inside a person and moves outward into relationships. Healthy people know that they are valuable and precious even when they make a mistake, are confronted by an angry person, are cheated or lied to, or are rejected by a lover, friend, patient, child, or boss. The sense of, of worth can be felt even when their hair has been cut too short by a barber, and even if they are overweight, experience bankruptcy, lose a tennis game, or realize they have been in, insulted or gossiped about. Healthy individuals may feel other emotions, such as guilt, fear, anger, and pain in these circumstances, but the sense of self-esteem or inherent worth remains intact. Mm, that's deep. I love mm. those examples she gives. Mm-hmm. Codependents experience difficulty with self-esteem at one or both of two extremes. At one extreme, self-esteem is low or non-existent. You think you are worth less than others. At the opposite extreme is arrogance and grandiosity. You think you are set apart and superior to others. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, I see. All right, where low self-esteem comes from. Children learn to, to self-esteem first from their major caregivers, but dysfunctional caregivers give their children verbally or non-verbally the message that the children are less than people. These less than messages from the caregivers become part of the children's own opinion of themselves. Upon reaching adulthood, it is almost impossible for these for those raised with less than messages to be able to generate the feeling from within that they have value. 
God, we're I'm arrogant. Impossible. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I didn't get that either. I mean, I, anyway, where arrogance and grandiosity come from? Arrogant and grandiose behavior arises out of one of two distinct situations. In the first, a family system teaches its children to find fault with others. The children thus learn to regard others as inferior to themselves. Such children may be criticized and shamed excessively by their care by the caregivers, but they can usually rise above the resulting sense of being less than by judging and criticizing others. Ah. That's what they do. They, they make themselves bigger by judging and criticizing others. Marsha? Uh-huh. Can you hear oh, me? It's, yeah, it's your turn. I know. Okay. Oh. I'm just saying that, that, they, that that's how they build themselves up by... Yes. That, yeah, that was good to hear, too, because I'm on YouTube, and sometimes people leave really nasty judging, judging, critical, uh, judging um, and critical remarks. Well, oh, critical okay. remarks that feel like it, they're really, that they're judging me pretty harshly. Mm -hmm. And it's good to know that sometimes, you know, it's coming out of them feeling bad about themselves, so not to take it personally. It's still, you know, not the funnest experience in the world, but okay. On the other hand, some dysfunctional family systems actually teach their children that they are superior to other people, giving them a false sense of power. Such children are treated by the family as if they can do no wrong. They are neither confronted and corrected when they make mistakes, nor guided into acknowledging and being responsible for their own imperfection. This kind of treatment is known as falsely empowering abuse. That's all you have? Uh, no, I'm just reading, rereading it because I didn't oh, understand. Oh, okay. This, this kind of treatment is known as falsely empowering abuse. These children receive a false sense of superiority over others in terms of value or worth. It sabotages relationships such just as much as the message of being less than others does. Other esteem. If codependents have any kind of esteem, it is not self-esteem, but what I call other esteem. Other esteem is based on external things, including some of the following. How they look, how much money they make, who they know, what kind of car they drive, what kind of job they have, how well, how well their children perform how powerful and important or attractive their spouse is, uh -huh. the, deg the degrees they have earned. Still there? Can you hear me? You're still there? Hello? Yeah. I'm here. I'm here. You can't hear me? Oh, yeah, I can, but you just stopped for a minute. Oh, Okay, well, I don't know which part. Okay, other esteem. Did you hear the whole thing? Uh, I didn't know. I didn't hear the whole list. Okay, other esteem. If codependents have any kind of esteem, it is not self-esteem, but what I call other esteem. Other esteem is based on external things, including some of the following. How they look, how much money they make, who they know, what kind of car they drive, what kind of job they have, how well their children perform, how powerful and important or attractive their spouse is, the degrees they have earned, how well they perform at activities in which others value excellence. Getting satisfaction or enjoyment from these things is fine, but it is not self-esteem. Other esteem is based either on one own human doing or on the opinions and behavior of other people. The problem is that the source of other esteem is outside the self and thus vulnerable to changes beyond one's control. One can lose this exterior source of esteem at any time. So other esteem is fragile and undependable. OK. 
A, I have four children. If any one of them starts to fail in some task, project, or relationship at any time, my life can quickly become unmanageable. When I base my esteem on their levels of success, I am only experiencing other esteem. And yet other esteem is all many of us have. How difficulty experiencing appropriate levels of self-esteem looks in action. Frank is a very wealthy 45-year-old architect who never developed self-esteem, never learned how to value himself from within. He has consequently gathered esteem from the outside and bases most of his other esteem on the fact that he has a lot of money and influence. When Frank lost his money through an unavoidable slump in the real estate market, he lost his whole sense of self-esteem and self-worth. Frank came into treatment profoundly depressed, believing that he was now absolutely worthless because he no longer had the money and power he had before. Since he did not have any experience with true self-esteem, he felt inadequate and lost. Uh, James, a wealthy lawyer who was in treatment when Frank arrived, had not lost his money. Though he believed that he was truly self-esteeming, his esteem was actually also based on the amount of money he had. James heard me explain that we experience true self-esteem from inside. I, ex <coughs> I explained that self-esteem originally comes from within because we have been esteemed by our parents for who, for who we are and not for what we do. Uh, but James still did not understand that the esteem he experienced was other esteem instead of self-esteem uh, because the money kept him in a state of delusion about where his esteem was coming from. James, now you, you seem to be fading out when you uh, go to the end of the sentence. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll make it a little louder. All right. Anyway, okay. the, James did still did not understand that the esteem he experienced was other esteem instead of self-esteem because the money kept him in a state of delusion about where his esteem was coming from. James was in a much more difficult position than Frank, uh, who could feel his lack of self-esteem and acknowledge it. As long as James had his money, he didn't know that there was a problem or that he experienced low or non-existent self-esteem. But the effects of his denied low self-esteem came out unconsciously in his close relationship. Mm.